So um, this time I'm going to talk about machine reading with neural networks. Um, and what is machine reading? Uh, machine reading is basically uh, you want to read a passage and uh, try to ans answer questions about that passage. Um, this is very popular nowadays, uh, and lots of people are working on it in various, uh, various ways. Um, this is in contrast to knowledge-based uh, based QA, um, where knowledge-based based QA uh, um, basically has a knowledge base with structured data where essentially if you can access the knowledge base in the correct way, you get the answer uh, for free. Um, but in this case, you actually need to synthesize the information in the passage as well and turn it into a format that you can use to compute. Um, another way you can think of this is that the passage is the knowledge base that you want to uh, work with. Um, so I talked a little bit about open information extraction uh, before where you wanted to extract information from, uh, from passages. So if you, for example, did that and access the knowledge base uh, that you extracted from the passage, then you could do QA with the methods that I've talked about so far. Uh, but most of the methods I'm going to talk about this time are not going to be working in that way and rather are going to be kind of based on matching uh, surface level uh, cues in the text. Um, so what kind of machine reading tasks do people do? Um, there's several different ways you can formulate these tasks and which way you formulate the task uh, will kind of dictate which methods you can use for this. Um, so the first one um, is the kind that you are doing on, uh, in the quizzes every time here, multiple choice questions, where you read a passage and try to answer multiple choice. Um, every time I make a joke that if you could make a, uh, a machine reading algorithm that takes the quiz for you, then you could, uh, you could use that instead of actually taking it yourself. But um, uh, I, forgot to tell, I forgot to tell this joke this class, so nobody has actually taken me up on this, but yeah. It, um, okay, if, you're, if your machine reading algorithm gets uh, more than 80% on the quizzes, then I'll give you extra credit, sure. <laughs> I'm actually a little bit worried about that, but if you actually do it, I will, I will actually give you extra credit. The amount uh, will be dictated by, by how well your algorithm does. Um, the first thing you need to do is learn how to read PDFs into a readable format. That's actually probably the hardest part of that task. So. Um, there's also span selection uh, algorithm uh, tasks uh, where basically the um, the answer is a text span within the uh, passage and you need to select the correct span. And there's also close or fill in the blank style tasks. And all of these have gotten some uh, degree of attention and I'm gonna give some examples in the next slides. So um, the multiple choice questions, um, one of the original ones in this was uh, MC test. Uh, this was a, a 500 passages and 2,000 questions about simple stories. Um, so you have to read the passage and answer the story, and it's like this. Um, in case you can't read, uh, James the Turtle was always getting in trouble. Sometimes he'd reach the freezer and empty out all the food. Uh, other times he'd uh, sled on the deck and get a splinter. Da -da 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 -da. You get to the end. Um, what was the name of the troublemaking turtle? Um, Fry's Pudding James Jane. Um, what did James pull off the shelves in the grocery store, pudding, fries, food, splinters, et cetera? And you need to answer these uh, multiple choice questions. Um, there's also a nice data set made uh, by Lionel here at, uh, at CMU. Um, this is from regular English comprehension test questions um, based on the uh, on tests from Chinese high schools or middle schools, I guess. Um, and uh, they're similar styles, but they're actually made for you know, humans to consume. Um, I've worked on this data set a little bit, and it's really hard. Um, so a lot of the questions require reasoning and, and kind of complex uh, uh, inference and stuff like this. Um, a CMU PhD student gets 95% of the answers correct, apparently. Um, Mechanical Turkers get about 75% of the answers correct, and um, so do the state-of-the-art algorithms on this task. So they get about 75%. So basically, um, state-of-the-art algorithms are as good as Mechanical Turkers, but not anywhere near as good as you guys. So, um, so you can take uh, 
you, you can take solace in that. Um, okay. For span selection, um, I, I think one of the interesting things about the multiple choice questions is they can be kind of arbitrarily difficult. Um, you can kind of come up with things that don't match the passage at all or require you to think about world knowledge, uh, et cetera, pretty easily. Um, however, models that solve these problems are actually a little bit harder to formulate. So um, there's also span selection. In span selection, the most famous one by far is, is squad, um, where you have 500 passages and 100,000 questions on Wikipedia text. And basically, it looks like this, where um, you have a passage from Wikipedia, and then you have uh, what causes precipitation to fall, and you need to select the span in the passage that answers this. So all of the answers have to be uh, exactly answerable by a span within the passage. Um, there's also Trivia QA, um, which is another one uh, that has a 95K question, 650K evidence documents. Um, and these uh, questions are um, basically the, the documents that you have to handle are more varied and more difficult. Um, and you have more documents than you have questions. So there's less overfitting to a, a particular passage um, as well. There's also lots of other ones, but these are just two, two examples here. Um, with respect to closed questions, um, there's the CNN uh, Daily Mail data set, which was created uh, from summaries of news articles. And you have to guess uh, the entity that will appear somewhere. Um, and basically, so we have the original, the BBC producer allegedly struck by Jeremy Clarkson will not press charges, etc. Um, and then you have a query, producer X will not press charges against Jeremy Clarkson, his lawyer says. Um, and one interesting thing they did here is they actually anonymized the data set uh, to replace all the entities with just kind of like random numbers um, to prevent you from remembering, for example, that uh, Oisin Taimon is a producer, which basically allows you to rule out uh, to not actually understand the passage and just use your background knowledge um, in order to fill uh, things in. Um, the, uh, in the entities, yeah, are anonymized to just prevent it from being solved with co-occurrence cues. Um, that being said, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to be able to solve these just from background knowledge. You know, if you train a huge language model over the entire web and it knows that uh, this person is a, a producer, then that's probably a reasonable thing to do. Um, but I think also the stuff they did here is a reasonable way to tease apart the effects of actually understanding the passage versus just you know, being able to fill in the blanks uh, from some statistics that you have from a, a large corpus. Um, so are there any questions about the, the types of tasks we have here? OK, I'll move on. So. Um, I think it's worth thinking uh, what is necessary for machine reading. Um, and lots of things are necessary for machine reading, you know, common sense, uh, you know, paraphrasing common sense, uh, lots of various high level things you can think of. But um, if we compare this with other um, tasks that we've done before, I think one important thing is we must take large amounts of information from a whole passage or a whole document and extract only the salient parts. And because of this, um, one powerful uh, way to do this is through better attention mechanisms that basically allow you to do smart matching between the, uh, the input and the output. Another thing is um, very often you have to perform some sort of reasoning about the information that you've extracted over multiple places in a document also. Um, so because of this, uh, a lot of work is focused on multi-step reasoning. So I'm going to focus on particularly uh, these two things. In most, not all, but most state-of-the-art machine reading models have both of these components incorporated somehow. So first I'm going to talk about attention models for machine reading. Um, and the, uh, the basic model so the, first, um, oh, so the first thing you need to think about is you need to have a question and you need to have a, um, a document. 
So these are two things that you definitely have as input. And then you might also have answer candidates uh, as well. So um, for multiple choice questions, you'll have three answer candidates, uh, you know, four answer candidates or something like that. So um, in order to do attention over a document, given a query, um, the first thing you do is uh, generate the document in the question and either generate an answer or uh, try to figure out um, how valid a particular answer is. Um, so the basic model for this uh, looks something like this. Um, you encode uh, the question in the document, maybe do some sort of modeling of interaction here, and then you uh, predict the answer out the other side. Um, so the, the problem with a extremely basic model um, where you encode the document a priori before even looking at the question is Encoding whole documents with high accuracy and coverage is hard. Um, so essentially, you need to re uh, remember all of the information in the document before you can answer. So in a way, um, I'm essentially being mean to you guys and making you take a quiz without going back and looking at the document where you got the reference information from. Uh, so um, we're not going to be so mean to our models, and we're going to ask them to solve the much easier problem where Usually, you can look at the question first and then read the document and find the, the answer that you want. So a first try at this is something called the uh, attentive reader. This was in one of the first uh, papers on uh, machine reading with neural nets. Um, and basically, what they do is they read the query, and then they, at they attend to the values in the con um, sorry, they attend to the values in the vectors for the documents. So the way this looks, is essentially you, um, you encode the query first. So this is the query over here. You get a vector. And then based on this vector, you encode, uh, you attend to the appropriate parts of the, um, uh, you attend to the appropriate parts of the document, uh, get a context vector, and then use the query in the context to uh, answer the question. Um, so this allows the model to focus on the relevant information. Um, one problem with this, though, is that the query is not considered during the actual encoding of the document. Um, so you first need to encode the document, at least encode all the, um, all the words in the document, and then uh, attend to all of them kind of uh, post hoc. So um, another... Uh, version of attention over documents that was proposed by um, Herman et al. in the same paper is something they call the impatient reader. And this is a, a, a somewhat unusual way of attending to, uh, of like reading a document when you get a question. Um, basically, they reread the entire document every time they get a new query token and update the understanding of the document. So basically, the idea is um, you get X first, and then um, once you get x, you update uh, your understanding of the document after x. Then you get visited. Um, you update your understanding of the document after you get visited. Then you get England, and you update your understanding of the document after you get England. And then you take all of these and, um, and get the final answer. So in a way, um, one way you can think of this is basically doing attention over and over again. Um, every time you get a new word in the query. Um, so this is a little bit bizarre from a human standpoint, I think. You don't actually like read one word of the question, then read the whole document, read another word of the question, then read the whole document. But um, I think one of the reasons why this is kind of interesting, um, or why, why it's kind of a, a reasonable model for machine understanding is actually, this allows you to do both attention and multi-hop reasoning in a way, because Every time you update this hidden vector r, you're essentially updating your belief about the information in the document with respect to the question. So um, it kind of conflates these two things, but uh, I think it's a, a reasonable model. And it definitely does better than their, uh, their attentive reader. Uh, sorry, their, uh, their attentive reader here. OK. Um, are there any questions about this so far? Okay, so this, this was kind of like seminal work on machine reading with uh, neural nets, but there's been a lot of progress made in the past uh, few years. Um, and specifically, um, the attention sum reader here um, 
he has a very intuitive idea, which is instead of attending um, to get a representation, you would uh, instead attend to each entity or each thing that you want to focus on in the source document, and then uh, sum the attentions to get your answer. So the score of the entity is the sum of the attention scores over all mentions of the entity. Um, so they have a nice diagram here. And basically, you see you have Obama and Putin and said Obama in Prague. And you have the attention over all of the entities that you're interested in calculating. And then the score of Obama is essentially equal to the sum of these scores here. Um, and similarly, you encode the question. And you use this question to do um, to calculate these attention scores. So um, one thing, one reason why this is good is actually if you consider that, um, you know, some things will be mentioned many, many times in, uh, in a particular document, all you need to do is find one instance that is very indicative that this is the answer to the question. And then you sum over all of them, or maybe there's the aggregate of the evidence from various places. And the aggregate of the evidence from various places allows you to, uh, to decide uh, that that would be the answer. So this allows you to handle both in a way. Um, so to take this even further, um, there's a model called attention over attention. Um, and basically, uh, this, uh, this paper, it's a nice paper. and. Um, Notably in the abstract, it very proudly states that they're the first people to do attention over attention. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that in itself is, uh, is a huge contribution, but it's a, um, it's a very, uh, it, it works very well and it has a very reasonable idea be behind it. Um, so the basic idea is that we want to know the words in the document that match best with the most important words in the query. So the idea being that, um, Within the query, there are certain words that are indicative of what you should be looking at in a document. Um, and those are the ones that you should be using uh, to find the most important words in the query. So the way this works is um, the, the diagram is a little bit complicated, but you have your document up here. You have your query down here. You take the dot product of the two. Um, and what this gives you is this gives you this matrix where each column is, uh, stands for one word in the document. Uh, sorry, each row stands for one word in the document, and each column stands for one word in the query here, right? Um, and then based on this, uh, we first have attention where we calculate um, which document words match each query word. So we do a column-wise softmax where for each word in the query, we, um, we calculate uh, the probability that we should be focusing on a particular word in the document. And then for each word in the query, we do attention to all of the words um, in the document, and then we take the column-wise average. So what this is saying is basically if the first word in the query is one that seems very important, or maybe the second word in the query is one that seems very important, uh, because it gets a large sum or large average uh, of attention overall, this is the one we should be using to, uh, to decide which document words to focus on. So um, I, I think this is, uh, this is a pretty neat idea. It's not too complicated. And most importantly, um, this also is currently the most effective uh, method on Squad, which is a very, very competitive uh, uh, leaderboard here. So. Um, the, uh, the, this method itself was in 2017, it was very briefly on top of the squad leaderboard and then the squad leaderboard is crazy. So, you know, like uh, it, it fell off the, the top pretty quickly, but now it's back on top. And the way it's back on top is by adding Bert as the encoder, which is like every single thing in the top 20 of the, of the leaderboard right now. Um, they also have data augmentation. I didn't find a paper describing their data augmentation method, but you might be able to find it. Um, and then this method is the kind of thing that's at the core. So it, it seems like it's still a good idea even in, uh, in 2019 as well. Um, okay, so this is just a few examples, um, but like you can see that the basic idea is you have the document, you have the query, and you do some sort of mutual attention over them and, and get your, uh, 
representations. Um, are there any questions about these before I move on to the next things? Okay. Um, so the next thing is um, choosing answer spans. So this is particularly important for span selection type methods. Um, and uh, the first thing is that we should talk about word classification versus span classification. So um, in an example like the, uh, the attention sum reader here, the attention sum reader was basically adding up over all instances of a word. Um, so this works for things where your answer is a word or maybe an entity that you treat as a single word, but it wouldn't work for things where you need to select um, a multi-word span or at least not work uh, trivially. Um, so uh, that's the case for things uh, like squad and many others. Um, so um, this can contrast to uh, single word uh, machine reading models where you need to pick a single word. It also contrasts to uh, things like named entity recognition. So things in named entity recognition are also selecting spans. Um, but when they select spans, they are able to select multiple spans. So basically what they're doing is they're only deciding whether a span is an entity or not, and not which of all of the spans in the entire uh, document is the one, the specific one that you're looking for. So um, to give an example of a span-based model, this is also a model that was very successful on, on tasks like squad. Um, it's called bidirectional attention flow. And um, the way it works is it also has basically a model of, um, of mutual attention over the document to context, context to document. Um, and basically both representations are concatenated to the word representations themselves in the document. And then this is used to select a span. Um, so the way it works basically is you have query to context. Um, you have query to context attention, context to query attention, similar to the, um, uh, the attention over attention model. Uh, then you concatenate these with the words uh, themselves. And then um, you have essentially a thing where you, um, where you predict the start and the end of the, uh, of the output here. Um, so you, uh, you have a softmax and a softmax over the, uh, over the start and the end. Um, actually, sorry. So, so basically what you want to do is you want to maximize the probability of the start and maximize the probability of the true end here. Um, so this is good, um, but one problem with it is basically start and end are largely independent, um, uh, choosing which is which. So you have to pick your start before you pick the end. And essentially, the, the choice of the start feeds into the end. Um, you can see the arrow here going between these. The so choice of the start feeds into the end through the neural network. But you have no way of looking at the end and saying, oh, maybe my start was, was not a good choice because I can't pick a good end. So um, the way that, uh, one way to solve this is having a dynamic uh, span decoder where you iteratively refine the left and right boundary. So basically, um, you pick the left boundary, um, then you pick the right boundary, then you pick the left boundary, and you pick the right boundary until you converge uh, to something that you, you think is your, uh, your final choice. Um, and you probably could think of a lot of other ways to do this uh, as well, but th this is just two uh, examples. OK. Um, so now, um, I think these are interesting. I think these models are interesting and they're, they're good if you're interested in, in coming up with uh, kind of machine reading style models, which I think are useful. But personally, I think the multi-step reasoning part is maybe the more, the more interesting part of these models. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways you can do multi-step, kind of quote unquote multi-step reasoning um, from ones that are essentially just you know, making your neural model richer, all the way to things that kind of incorporate uh, things that look like symbolic reasoning um, uh, that we had in, uh, in logic, et cetera. So I'll talk about uh, both of these. So um, kind of on the, the, oh yeah, sorry. So first, um, to give an example of why this is necessary, 
is um, it might be become clear that more information is necessary after you've started processing the, the input. And one example of this is you have um, John went to the hallway and John put down the football. This is a very short passage, so it's not, you know, it's not super interesting or not super obvious that you would necessarily need multi-step reasoning to solve this. Um, but if you think of kind of the shortest path to solving, um, solving this uh, question, the first thing you can do is attention and identify, oh, football. I should be paying attention to football uh, because it appears in the question. And then you say, but wait, you know, I know about football, but in this sentence, I don't have any place, essentially. I don't have any place that I should be paying attention to. And I know because it's a where question, I should have a place. So then the next thing you can do is hop, you know, a f one sentence or a few sentences back and say, okay, now, now that I focused on football, the next thing I want to do is find a place uh, that, seems, uh, that seems like that is where John was when he put down the football. So then you hop back, you get a hallway. So you can kind of think of a, a very natural two-step process that would allow you to answer this question. So step one being attend to football, step two being attend to John, um, and then you find John was in the hallway. <clears throat> so as an aside, um, traditional computational semantics um, is really good at reasoning. Um, so if you don't think about neural networks um, at all and you go back to um, kind of traditional logic-based uh, computational semantics, um, there are a lot of there, there are methods that basically turn things into predicates and uh, conjunctions between predicates and you know entailment uh, relations, um, et cetera, uh, and can reason about whether all things happen, whether something exists, um, whether things are true or not, and do this sort of tabular uh, reasoning to deduce um, whether uh, whether this original statement is true. And um, there's whole programming languages that allow you to, to do this, like Prolog is a programming language that um, allows you uh, to figure out how to do this. And if you're interested in reasoning, um, this bo uh, book here is very, very interesting. Um, and it's very easy. It has code that you can play around with uh, written in the book. Um, and it will show you just how powerful these original methods were, the kind of difficult things they could handle, and also the difficult problems um, that you have to consider uh, when doing these things. So like um, uh, one typical example is the scope of negation. So if I say um, not, one, not, one farmer was, not one farmer was guilty of beating his donkey or something like that. Um, uh, and for some reason, computational semantics really loves donkeys. I don't, I don't know why. But um, uh, not one farmer was found guilty of beating his donkey. How many donkeys are there? Um, so then you need to know whether there was one donkey uh, where none of the farmers were found guilty of beating it, or whether there, each farmer has a donkey and, um, and like, uh, um, yeah, whether each farmer has a donkey and nobody was found guilty. Um, or even simple things like he, uh, he, he, was not, uh, he was not found guilty of stealing the donkey, or he was found guilty of stealing the donkey from Jeff. Uh, did he have a donkey at some point? Um, and then the answer is probably yes, because if you stole it, then that implies that you had it at some point, et cetera. So um, you can write things down like this very, very easily in a very rich language. And I think neural networks can do this to some extent, but they can't do it anywhere nearly as precisely or in, uh, in complicated ways, except some of the things that I'm going to talk about at the very end of this section. Um, so let's first talk about a really rough approximation um, that nonetheless, you, you could argue, is doing some sort of multi-hop reasoning. Um, and that specifically is memory networks. And memory networks are a general formulation of models that access an extra external memory uh, through attention. And also, um, 
this paper gives a specific instantiation for document level QA. Um, so in the specific uh, model that they propose here, um, what they do is they first do, um, uh, okay, so actually let me, let me explain a little bit more about the general framework. So the general framework is basically, um, uh, it's like you, you have a memory where the memory, The memory is just essentially a, a bunch of vectors. Um, and for each of the vectors, you can, th this paper came out like just the same time attention was coming out, so they didn't call it attention, but it basically is attention. You then um, attend to uh, each of the slots. Um, so this is a attention vector that basically sums up to one. And based on this slot, you can either read the memory which is turning this into a single vector um, by doing attention over it, or you can write to the memory. And the way you write the memory is basically you have a, a vector that you want to be writing, and then according to the attention, you uh, update uh, the vectors here based on what you're, what you're attending to. So it's basically like, um, it's like attention, but instead of only reading from it, you can also write to it. So um, that would be my, my very short summary of memory networks. So um, in the specific model that they proposed here, um, the way they do this is by first doing um, argmax attention over this um, this memory um, uh, that they have, where the memory in this case could uh, you know be the encoded words in all in the document or something like this, um, and then based on this they get their uh, their output number one, um, and then they do an additional argmax step uh, to get a second element from memory conditioned on the first. So the basic idea being um, you, you get your output from the memory, and then once you've gotten the output from the memory, you take a, a second step of attention over the memory again, and uh, you, get the second, uh, you get the second piece of memory. And then you use both to get the answer, both to do your softmax. Um, and then you, know, you could take multiple steps. You could take three steps, four steps, five steps. Um, but the idea here, is basically if you do if you do two steps of memory, you could first attend and get football as your first, you know, uh, the first thing that you attended to, and then in the second mem memory step, you could attend to maybe hallway based on the fact that you attended to football the first time. Um, okay, so it, are there any questions or yeah? How big can be sort of memory? What are the constraints on how big the memory can get? So in the general idea of like memory networks, um, the constraints are as big as your computer can hold, basically. Like um, as big as your computer can hold and also as big as, you know, could be learnable without distracting the model, I guess. So um, it's compu computation constraints and like learnability constraints. but. I think you could make it as big as you wanted. Is there a threshold on which like, it has to be this big to sort of work? Is there a threshold on how big it has to be to work? That's a good question. Um, I My guess would be no. Probably, you know, at the very worst, um, if, you're, if you're adding some sort of memory component into your model, um, you know, at the very worst, the model will just learn to ignore it and use whatever information you give it. So. Um, probably even a small amount of memory would be better than not having it. Um, it does make the training process more complicated. So if you overcomplicate the, like if it's genuinely not necessary and it just stands to overcomplicate the training process then it might hurt things, but you know, uh, that's true for any neural network, I guess. Um, any other questions? It's a good question though. I, I, I also don't actually know the answer because right? I haven't used it myself. Um, okay, so um, so basically this was a very preliminary attempt at this. Um, hopefully by now this argmax is scaring people in the class because you know you can't backpropagate through an argmax. Um, so the next thing, and now that attention had been you know proposed and everybody was using attention for things, the next obvious thing is just to soften this into a soft 
uh, attention instead of doing an argmax. So um, they use uh, standard softmax attention in multiple layers. Um, so basically, they, um, they don't just do two layers of reasoning. They do multiple layers of reasoning over the memory uh, in, until, they, uh, until they make a prediction. Um, so um, this, is, uh, this is good. This is a, I, I would recommend reading this paper if you want an actual model that you, you want to use in your, in your method. Um, so I mentioned multi-hop multi reasoning. And um, then the question becomes, when are you going to stop reasoning? Um, when are you going to stop thinking about what you should be doing next and actually do something? Um, and uh, actually, before I do this, does anyone know um, what, how you would decide to do this um, when you are doing actual symbolic logical reasoning? Um, so like if we go back here, um, let's say we have this kind of theorem prover type thing that can expand uh, theorems in various ways. Um, uh, so, so when would you know when to stop? Thinking about things. I'm guessing. Yeah. Would it be like a dot on or a tautology? So tautologies you you use to kind of seed your model, maybe. So like if you have a if you have a tautology, um, it's something that is. Uh, wait, no, sorry. Am I mixing up tautology and axiom? Maybe I am. Yeah. Um, so the so basically uh, yeah maybe, maybe actually sorry maybe you're maybe you're correct I, I think I was mixing up my terminology for a second but um, basically um, a lot of the ways that these things work is if you want to try to prove that something is true um, one way to prove it is by um, by inverting it um, and proving by contradiction um, so the way that these re you know, theorem provers or things work is they walk through and they work until they try to find something that contradicts the original, um, essentially the original hypothesis. And um, once they find something that contradicts the original hypothesis, um, then they're done. They, they know they've proved that it's true. Unfortunately, um, it's very often the case that you can't <laughs> prove that it's true. Uh, given the information that you have. So then you just keep working and working and working forever uh, until you run out of computation credits on your cluster that you're using or something like this. So um, you, you set some sort of patience and then you can't say, I was able to prove this was false. You can just say, I wasn't able to prove that it was true. So, um, uh, <coughs> yeah, so um, that's uh, an interesting thing here. Um, there was actually a paper, um, a while ago where they were talking about um, solving high school math questions with a theorem prover like this. And basically, they had a natural language understanding module um, that would turn all of, the, um, all of the text into these kind of uh, you know, logical formulas. And then they had a theorem proving module that would then go in and prove uh, the answer. And if you if you were able to prove the answer, it would give you this 10-page uh, thing of theorem proving, like <laughs> theorem proving logic that would then tell you why it was able to get the answer correct. Um, uh, but anyway, interestingly, for high school and college math questions, um, the theorem prover was actually the bottleneck about half the time. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that even if you do symbolic theorem proving, that you can solve like hard math, uh, hard math questions. But um, even if you were able to do NLP perfectly. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's an aside. So OK, so how do you do this in neural networks? Um, uh, Weston et al. Uh, basically took a fixed number of sequences. Um, so you, you just reason for n uh, amount of time where you, you take n steps. Um, in uh, Kumar et al. 2016, they had a special like stop reasoning symbol. Um, and basically, when they attended to this, instead of a uh, component of, of the memory, that was a sign that you needed to stop, and then you would make the prediction from, uh, from that particular point. Um, then uh, this paper used reinforcement learning to decide when to stop reasoning. Um, I 
their results were better, um, although it wasn't entirely clear to me why they were better, but apparently this, uh, this seems like a, a good idea. Okay, um, are there any questions about this? Okay, um, so next I'll, I'll move to course defined question answering. So I think this is really important, and this is actually um, a very common thread in any sort of thing that's based on informa information retrieval. Um, but especially in information retrieval, like where you're doing web search over the entire web, um, essentially you cannot run a neural network over the entire web most of the time. You might be able to do it once if you're really rich or something like this. But um, even if you do that, you can't have something like um, uh, attention over attention, where you read the whole document and you do mutual attention over things and, um, uh, and things like uh, this. So it, it would just be too expensive. So it's a very common that you have a course model, which gets you kind of in the right neighborhood of things that you should be answering. And then a fine grained model that allows you to, um, to, you know, with high accuracy, pick out the answer from uh, the fine grained uh, stuff. So. Um, with information retrieval, basically what you want to do is you want to find a, a candidate list of documents uh, with a, a very fast model and then re-rank them with a, you know, uh, with a less fast but more accurate model. Or in the case of question answering or machine reading, you might want to take a really, really long document and then from that really, really long document, select a sub-passage where you're pretty sure the answer is in that passage. And then within that passage, uh, try to answer the, the question. So, um, this Troy et al. paper, basically what you do is you take the query and the document, um, you have sentence sec selection, and um, then you get a document summary, and then you have an answer generation RNN, uh, where this uh, takes more time. Um, so uh, basically, um, this is done through reinforcement learning, where the sentence is that you select um, to make the summary are latent variables, and you need to optimize over them. Um, so you can train this using reinforce or, or other uh, methods like that. Um, you can also think of this as a variety of multi-hop reasoning where you select, uh, your first hop is kind of selecting the course information you need and the next hop is uh, selecting here. So um, you might, as far as I know, there's no model that actually does this, but you might actually want to first uh, read a sentence and then Try to find the answer. If you can't find the answer, go back and find other sentences that you want to read based on that, on the fact, on your reading of the sentence. So you could also see this as an iterative process as well. Um, this has also been done for retrieval and QA. So this is where you want to basically answer questions over the entirety of Wikipedia. Um, so there are also methods that, uh, that do this as well. OK. Um, so now something that's, uh, that's much more involved, but also very cool. Um, so I've been kind of mentioning symbolic uh, theorem proving over, uh, over knowledge bases. And um, one of the reasons why I've been suggesting this is there actually are neural models uh, for doing this sort of symbolic reasoning. And um, basically what they do is they take uh, the, the tabular methods for theorem proving where basically um, they uh, do things like uh, taking um, multiple candidates for how you can expand your reasoning and, uh, and based on this uh, choose which candidates to do next and then also uh, search over, um, over you know, various candidates and how, how do you swap in variables, uh, et cetera. And, um, because this isn't a this isn't a, a semantics class, I'm not going to be going through exactly how they do this. But the basic thing that you should know is um, what I mentioned before. Essentially, models will reason forever if they don't if they can't find the answer. So they'll just search and search and search and search uh, to find something that uh, uh, that satisfies the answer and, and proves uh, improves. Uh, that it's correct. And essentially what this is doing is, number one, it's learning a search order that you can use to, uh, to do this kind of logical inference. Number two, it's also learning to weight um, 
you know, different rules. So like it can learn um, when some of these rules are kind of like fuzzy rules that only apply in some percentage of cases. So uh, this allows you to do probabilistic reasoning over the, the answers of this uh, uh, theorem proving as well. So this is a very cool paper. It will take a read or two through to fully understand if you don't know the background and you probably have to read the, um, the, the cited works, et cetera. But it's a pretty, I, I like it a lot. Okay, um, are there any questions uh, so far? Okay, um, so also um, in 2018, uh, there was kind of a, uh, further interest in question answering with context. And the basic idea here is um, that you get questions in sequence. Uh, so context from previous questions must be used in the next answer. And um, the idea is if you have uh, Daffy Duck origin in history, your first question is what is the origin of Daffy, Daffy Duck? Then the second question is what was he like in that episode? Um, was he the star? Who was the star? Etc. So you just kind of go through, and each question is in reference to the uh, previous one, and also the answer. Um, you know, also with respect to the answers. So in order to do this well, you need to step through uh, one by one, and you know, get the answers correct, uh, etc. And this is meant to. Um, this is meant to essentially uh, simulate a dialogue system that's answering questions about things and might get uh, questions that are dependent on context. So these are um, two nice data sets, uh, Quack and, um, and Coca, uh, which are based on this. They came out at virtually the same, the same time. So you can take a look at either. Okay. <clears throat> so um, right now, um, Machine reading has gotten a huge amount of interest for a very good reason. I think it's, it's interesting. It's a, a good way to test our abilities to do NLP in a kind of general but challenging setting. Um, and because of this, now a lot of people have made data sets to test some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, some variety of human-like reasoning. Um, or sorry, some variety of machine reading and um, like, one caveat about it is all data sets have their biases. And actually, I should probably, um, uh, I should me probably mention this from a broader uh, like scope, which is this is not solely a problem of machine reading. It's a problem with every, everything we do um, in NLP. And there's actually a really nice paper um, called um, Data Statements for Natural Language Processing um, by Emily B Bender and uh, Batya Friedman. And basically the idea of this paper is um, that we need to be aware of where our data comes from and how the data was created, et cetera. And it gives some specific recommendations like, um, Um, like, what are, why did you make the data set in the first place? So think about why, why this data set was created, um, what uh, texts were included, and why did you select them in this particular way, um, et cetera. And this can help users uh, make inferences about what kind, uh, what other kind of texts uh, systems trained on this could be, could generalize to. So like if you subselected in a particular way, uh, for a particular reason, if you maybe only selected short Wikipedia articles, would this gener generalize to long Wikipedia articles? Also, what variety of language is it? Is it um, standard, you know, like American English, or is it um, British English, or is it Indian English, or is it um, not even English? Is it's you know, is it a different language, etc. Um, and also, what are the demographics of the speakers? Like, do you expect that they're of a particular age, gender, ethnicity, et cetera? And be aware that if you sample things only from these people, it might not generalize to other people. So like if you sample um, 
social media text from Reddit, 75% of the people on Reddit are males, so you're less likely to be able to, uh, if there are systematic differences between how men and women uh, write text on Reddit, you'd be less likely to do well on, on, uh, on processing uh, women's text, for example. Also, um, what are the demographics of the annotators? What are the speech situations, et cetera? So I think this paper is really interesting because it makes you think about like what are the things you need to consider. Um, this is not exactly what I'm going to be talking about this time, though I'm mainly going to be talking about uh, biases in subselection and data creation itself. Um, so um, no matter what the task is, the data bias matters, uh, domain bias, simplifications, et cetera. Um, but in particular for reading comprehension, uh, real and large scale uh, data sets are hard to come by. And um, many data sets that were created from weak supervision have not been vetted uh, by humans, uh, actually been vetted by humans. So um, one case study, which I don't, I don't mean to beat up on this data set too much, like just a little bit, but um, <laughs> uh, there's this baby data set which was, um, uh, which automatically generated synthetic te text aimed at evaluating whether a model can learn cer certain characteristics of language. Um, so like there's single supporting fact, two supporting facts, three supporting facts, two argument relations, et cetera. Um, but this is, if you look at the text you have here, it's a really, really simplified, you know, like version of English that doesn't actually handle most of the difficult things in natural language processing. Um, so this is fine if it's considered toy data, but then if you have people in you know, machine learning basically saying, oh, we've come up with a model for natural language understanding that can solve all of the, all of the tasks uh, that you have to do for natural language understanding based on the fact that it solved this data set, obviously you know, that's overstating, uh, overstating a bit. So I think the aspiration is, is interesting. I think it would have been much better if they had used automatically, sorry, if they had harvested naturally occurring examples of these, you know, things that you need to do for these. Um, so here's another, you get two extra credit uh, chances in this class. One chance is to solve all your quizzes using machine reading. The second one is to write a prologue solver for baby. And if you can write a prologue solver for baby, uh, then I'll, I'll also give you extra credit. Um, it wouldn't be that hard, which is the only reason why I, uh, why I suggested that you might try. Um, another examination of, uh, of a data set is the CNN Daily Mail data set, um, where uh, essentially what they did was they analyzed the CNN Daily Mail data set and revealed very few sentences requiring multi-sentence reasoning. So it was basically just pattern matching most of the time. And many were too difficult due to anonymization or wrong pre-processing. So it, as I said, in the CNN Daily Mail data set, they anonymized the entities to prevent you from uh, kind of just solving it with a language model. Um, but they found that, um, you know, co-reference errors in the original pre-processing caused about 8% of the errors, and 17% uh, were like too ambiguous or hard. And they have examples which is like, um, a um, entity one, entity two, and entity three um, visited uh, Baghdad this week. And the answer is who visited Iraq? And the answer is entity two, um, which is kind of hard to solve given that entity one and entity three also seem like pretty good ideas, right? So, um, another um, nice example of uh, how uh, essentially data set bias, or essentially solving the, um, the problems of a particular data set are, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're solving all of machine reading, is uh, this thing of adversarial examples in machine reading. And basically the idea is um, if you add a sentence or word string specifically designed to distract the model, um, uh, this can drop the accuracy of state-of-the-art models for about 81 uh, to 46 on squad. And basically the idea is you take what city did Tesla move to in 1880, and you, uh, you add uh, Tadakatsu moved to the city of Chicago in 1881, uh, where Tesla, um, Tesla doesn't appear anywhere in the sentence. Um, you just add a sentence that's basically automatically generated from this. 
um, and add a random entity in here, and you still can fool uh, most of these systems. And of course, if you, um, of course, if you then add a bunch of these sentences to your model and train your model to specifically avoid these sent adversarially generated sentences, it would do better on these adversarially generated sentences, but that doesn't mean it really generalizes to new sentences. You come up with a new variety of an adversarial sentence and it would fool uh, the model just, just as badly. Um, so this brings up serious questions, like let's say we get 81 on squad or like 88 on squad, which is quote unquote human level performance, how much of the time would humans actually be fooled by this? And the answer is almost never, right? So um, I think this is a good general uh, thing to think about. Um, there's also been work on adversarial creation of new data sets. And basically the, the idea is um, you take a good model that represents the state of the art at the moment and, um, uh, and basically generate uh, distractor examples that fool the kind of state of the art models for the moment. So the process is you first train a good language model and based on this good language model, you, um, you generate potential answers for a question. Um, so just sample 10,000 potential answers for a particular question from a language model directly. Um, and then you run your QA model over all of those question, over all of those answers. And you see which ones the, the model incorrectly classifies as the correct answer compared to you know, the actual correct answer. Um, and then finally you have humans filter for naturalness. So basically you generate a big candidate set of distractor answers. You find ones that current models do poorly on and then you, um, uh, then you do this. And the idea being that um, you, you want to find things that humans still do very well on but current models don't do well on. And eventually once we get to the point where we can no longer do this process, then we've probably achieved you know, human level performance, right? Because we can no longer find answers that humans do well on, but, uh, but the machines uh, do poorly on. Um, another data set that's really interesting, um, and I like, I like it, uh, is the natural questions data set. And the basic idea is instead of like taking a pas passage and creating questions from the passage, they instead take actual questions um, from search logs and then they find passages that help answer this question and, uh, and use these as pairs. So um, this is a paper by Google and because Google has search logs, they can find you know, questions that are asked frequently by their users. And um, then they can use crowd workers to find the corresponding evidence. So an example is, um, what color was John Wilkes Booth's hair? Um, and the answer is, um, some critics called Booth the handsomest man in America and a natural genius and noted having astonishing memory. Others were mixed in the ex estimation of his acting. He stood five feet, eight inches tall and had jet black hair. So um, you, uh, uh, you need to find this answer jet black. Um, can you make and receive calls in airplane mode? The answer is no. Um, and why does Queen Elizabeth sign her name Elizabeth R? And um, then you have a, a passage that doesn't entail the answer, uh, that doesn't entail the answer whatsoever. So I think one very strong argument for this data set is it's made in a similar fashion as, uh, as other data sets like SQUAD, but they're actually real questions where the questions came first and then the, the answers to the questions came after. So I feel like, you know, at least if you're making progress on this, you're making progress on questions that people actually ask. Uh, so it, it's probably a good thing. Okay, um, that, <clears throat> that's all I have for today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions entailed by my slides or not. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm curious, like, um, for any model, for machine reading, like, how far, like, uh, what is max, max length, approximately, for the maximum length for the model to um, achieve some kind of probability result? What's the maximum length for the model to achieve reasonable results? So I think actually um, the answer is, 
if you use something like if you use something like this, um, people have shown that you can actually scale up to the entirety of Wikipedia. So you can answer questions um, over all of Wikipedia. Of course, they're not processing all of Wikipedia with a transformer uh, to answer each question. What they're doing is they're retrieving things that look reasonable and then running over that. Um, with respect to, um, like, if you just wanted to run the whole thing through your model, I think you're probably more limited by memory uh, than you're limited by the actual quality of the model itself. Um, I don't know this for, for certain, but I bet um, you would actually probably do better if you didn't have to do the subselection first and then just ran your model over everything. It just would be too computationally expensive, uh, both uh, time and memory wise. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this uses full Wikipedia articles, and those can be quite long. Okay, but it could, it could, all, um, it could also cover like, uh, several topics in the same article and for the model it could... Right, so that's the reason why attention is important, right? Attention of some type. So this particular model has hard attention over sentences. So basically it's removing all of the things that it thinks is not useful and then doing the more softer, more uh, complicated attention over the sentences it does choose. So, yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, the way we have been trying to figure out the performance is either get the humans to evaluate on the data set or uh, figure out how well it's a model performing. But is there any intrinsic way of figuring out how difficult a data set is? So that's a, that's a really good question. So can we figure out how difficult our data set actually is? Um, I don't, I think the only, the only thing that I would really trust to say difficulty is how well humans um, who are taking a test to figure out whether they're going to get a job or get into school um, do on this uh, do on this test. So I don't trust mechanical turkers um, because if they're not motivated to do well on the test, they're not going to try very hard, right? So um, you, you need to have people who are motivated to do well and answer the question. That being said, could you come up with metrics that are correlated with how hard a question is to answer? And I, I'm sure you definitely could. Um, like, for example, if you think that multiple hops of reasoning are necessary, how far away are those hops in the document? Um, is, the, is the answer itself actually included in the document or is it just a paraphrase? Um, uh, what type of question is it? Is it a why question? Is it a what question? Is it a how question? Um, is it a Boolean yes, no question? How many? feasible options are there in the document. So like I think there's all kinds of things that you could find that would correlate with how difficult it is, but the only thing I actually trust is how well like invested humans are doing it answering. Yeah. Um, but good good question. Yeah. Um, any other ones? Okay, if not I will uh, finish up. Thanks.